Physics and Volleyball, Alex Mabry. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the history, the basics, how Newton's laws ties into volleyball, the Magnus effect in volleyball, momentum and impulse theorem, fundamentals of volleyball, a conclusion of my presentation, some fun facts, and my work cited page. Okay, the history of volleyball. Volleyball was originally created by William G. Morgan in 1895. He originally called the sport Mentonet, yet he renamed the sport volleyball due to players players attempting to volley the ball over the net to one another. The sport became widespread in 1920, and this was mainly due to the United States Volleyball Association, which was established in 1928. So now I'm going to talk about the basics of volleyball, so go over some of the rules. So each team is allowed six players on the court at a time. Each team is allowed a maximum of three hits in a row. Games are played the best three of five sets, and each set will go to 25 points. However, the team must win by two points, so that does not mean 25 points is the limit. There have been games going way high into the 50s or 60s. So the positions in volleyball are the setter, who allows hitters to uh, be able to make a play with the ball, the middle blocker, who is the key defensive player, the left hitter, who is one of the key offensive players, the libero, who is the strongest defensive player and plays only on the back row, the middle back, who is basically the same as libero, it's just if there is no libero, there's a middle back, the left back, who is a strong cover, and right back, who is a backup setter. So now I'm going to talk about how Newton's laws ties into volleyball. Newton's first law is commonly known as the law of inertia, which is formally stated as every object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. The volleyball continues traveling due to the force acted on it by a player, and it continues traveling stopping only due to the force of gravity acting upon it or a player intercepting the motion, so whenever the ball changes directions. Um, one example of the law of inertia can be seen in volleyball at the highest arc of a server's toss when the ball is nearly motionless. It either falls straight down to the, due to the force of gravity if the player does not serve it, or it will sail across the net from the force of the hand striking it during the serve. In an example of a moving object, like say the volleyball is being passed to player, one player to another, um, it moves in a fairly straight line unless deflected by the force of the net, the receiver's forearms, a blocker's hands, or the floor. Newton's second law can be formally stated as the acceleration of an object as produced by a net force is directionally proportional to the magnitude of the net force in the same direction as the net force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Simply stated, that is force times mass force equals mass times acceleration. The volleyball's movement and speed are affected by different variables such as different amounts of force from each player during a game. Smaller athletes are more agile on the court because of their lower mass. <laughs> that means they accelerate and decelerate quickly, which is particularly critical on defense. Heavier athletes need more time to get into position or more leg straight to get there as quickly. The faster the arm swing of the player, the more force will be exerted on a spiked volleyball or a hit volleyball at the moment of contact. The harder you hit the ball, the faster it will travel due to an increase in force and acceleration, while similarly, a lighter ball travels faster than a heavier ball. Okay, so Newton's third law is also known as the law of opposing action, and that's formally stated, for every force there is a reaction force that is equal in size but opposite in direction, or more simply put, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This can be seen when volleyball players leap off the floor or when they jump up to, say, block the ball. The force exerted by their feet downwards is countered by an opposing upwards force exerted by the floor. If the floor didn't push back, athletes wouldn't be able to leave the ground. The opposing force from the floor is also why people get have sore feet after long practices and some bruises after hitting the floors. The ball can only hit your hand or your body as hard as your hand hits the ball.
Okay, next I'm going to talk about the Magnus effect and how it, um, it acts in volleyball. So the Magnus effect can be defined as the generation of sideways, sidewise force on a spinning cylindrical or spherical solid immersed in a fluid, say a liquid or a gas, and there has to be a relative motion between spinning body and the fluid that it's traveling through. So players use this effect to curve the volleyball downwards towards the floor in order to score points for their team. This occurs because of differences in the pressure of the ball and the air it's traveling through. So as the ball is spinning, spinning through the air, it drags the air around it as well. This creates a drag force which approached, opposes the airflow, which in turn increases the airflow. This means the pressure builds up in the direction the ball is turning and forces it to move at a downward angle away from the increase in pressure. This effect allows players to hit the ball with large amounts of force and the ball still hit the court inside the boundary lines. Okay, the momentum impulse theorem. So the momentum impulse theorem is defined as a change in the momentum of an object will equal the impulse applied to it. So that just means that momentum is equal to the force on the ball times what the time it takes for the force to be exerted. Um, logically, the impulse momentum theorem is equivalent to, the New to Newton's second law of motion or the force law. Next, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of volleyball, so some of the positions and the movements. So, arguably one of the most important methods of volleyball is serving, and it is your most common method of scoring points. Um, the object is to serve the ball fast and low over the net, and this causes the volleyball to become a projectile. A projectile is defined as object upon which the only force is acting is gravity. So the volleyball becomes a projectile after it leaves the player serving the ball's hand. In order for the ball to gain speed and momentum, the player serving the ball must use their hips and legs to channel and transfer energy to the ball. As the ball moves in an upward fashion through the air, there is a downward force and a downward acceleration on the ball. This means that the ball is slowing down while still moving upwards, where eventually it will slow down and begin moving in a downwards direction. Gravity influences the movement of the projectile and causes the ball to shift in a downwards direction, causing a vertical acceleration. Once again, the Magnus effect comes into play, and this is what forces the projectile to curve in a downwards direction than if acting by gravity alone due to airflow. So the next thing is defense. All teams must have defense in order to be successful. Um, the ball comes over the net at very varying angles and speeds, and a player must move to successfully pass the ball up to make a play. Players must stay low to the ground for quicker movement to the ball and, a and move with a strong flat platform to successfully pass the ball to their players. A ball moving with greater force means the player must cushion the ball when they receive it. This is most often achieved by the player breaking apart their platform as the ball hits it. The ball then can no longer rebound as high as it normally can due to the loss in energy. This will increase the time of contact, which in turn decreases the force. The decrease in force can be explained because force and time are inversely proportionate to one another. So as the contact increases, the force on the ball must decrease. This can also be tied into Newton's third law, which says for, each, uh, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And that's just restating how the for, um, force and momentum react with one another. Okay, so I'm going to talk about setting now. Setting is one of the most controlled aspects of the entire sport of volleyball, and it is one of the most key elements of the entire game. Without the setter, there is no um, offensive motion. So the setter has the greatest amount of control over the ball and where the ball ends up. They must apply, apply force and transfer energy to the ball in order for the ball to be able to accelerate enough to reach the hitters. Hand positioning is key for setters due to surface area. The setters must hold their hands out with enough space to allow for a greater surface area to increase contact with the ball. However, the setter's fingertips are the only thing that touches the actual volleyball, and this allows for the greatest possible control and transfer of energy from the player to the volleyball. 
Spiking, hitting, and tipping is the most likely method a team will use to score. Scoring points requires quick movement and a rapid transfer of energy. Players using greater amounts of force results in greater acceleration and momentum, which will ultimately create larger displacement and a greater likelihood of scoring a point. Timing is of the utmost importance when attempting to hit a volleyball. When making an approach to hit the ball, the player must take off quickly. This will build up kinetic energy, and the end goal will be to transfer all that kinetic energy into potential energy. Potential energy is the product of the mass of the player, gravity, and height of the jump, but the height is what determines how much energy will be attained. The shorter the time of contact between the player's hand and the ball, the larger the force exerted on the ball is, this will create a greater overall momentum exerted by the ball. Okay, in conclusion, volleyball uses physics in almost every single thing it does, and it is normally not known by the players that they're actually using physics concepts. However, for someone to play such a complex and unique sport as this, they will have to have a basic physics understanding. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some fun facts about volleyball. So during a volleyball game, and the average volleyball player will jump 300 times. The first actual volleyball that was designed was in 1900. The volleyball, volleyball is the second most popular sport in the world, being only beaten out by soccer. The longest volleyball game ever was in North Carolina, and it took 75 hours and 30 minutes. And approximately 46 million people play volleyball a week, but worldwide the number is 800 million a week. And this is my work cited. Thank you very much.